Hello, am I disrupting your scrolling? Well, sorry, not sorry, because today here on Bright Ideas, disruption is the name of the game. And we're moving fast with lots of pauses for water breaks. And we're breaking things. That wasn't like irreplaceable, right? And we're getting to the bottom of how to know innovation when you spot it in the wild and what to do with that insight as a new investor. Cue the light bulb, because this is an especially bright episode of Bright Ideas. I'm Rob Phil, and I'm so excited for the topic of this episode. Well, for a couple reasons. First of all, because innovation is just such an interesting part of our culture. If you've watched any of the gazillion shows out there about startup founders, you know being an industry disruptor is a subject of endless fascination. And we're going to talk about that innovative drive later in the show, but first, I wanted to disrupt my own monologue by introducing Chris Lee. Chris is a portfolio manager at Fidelity. He keeps close tabs on which industries out there are primed for disruption, and by who, and how that can create opportunity for investors. Chris, welcome. Hi, Rod. Thanks so much for having me and really excited to talk disruption and innovation with you. So disruption is a word that has become pretty unavoidable and in embracing it the way we have, I feel like we've skipped over recognizing that it used to be something you can get in trouble for has a, a negative connotation, <laughs> like being disruptive in school. But now I can invest in it. So what's that about? Yeah. So when we talk about disruption in terms of investing, what we're really talking about is doing something differently or doing something better. So disrupting the norm, for example, when maybe the norm itself wasn't quite as good as we thought it could have been. Mm -hmm. you know, that could be like a new product that delivers a better customer experience or service that's delivered to consumers more effectively or more efficiently and potentially in a lower cost fashion. So our lives have been somewhat disrupted these last couple of years, if we're going to be honest, right? And I have to imagine that some disruption and innovation came out of that. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, we became much more reliant, for example, on e-commerce. And innovators in that space move very quickly to improve customer service, you know, creating a simpler and more seamless experience. You know, think of all of the startups who disrupted the on-demand food delivery space, you know, with everyone rushing in to see who could get you your burrito or smoothie the fastest. And one of my new favorites, the return of the QR code. Yeah, exactly. You know, not a brand new innovation, mm -hmm. but an innovative application of it. You know, another example that's worth talking about is peer-to-peer -peer payments. You, know, may, you may not remember how difficult it used to be to split a restaurant check with a group of friends, but now you can just wirelessly send someone your share of the bill through an app on your phone. Can we just acknowledge that we literally carry amazing feats of innovation around with us all the time, and we almost think nothing of it? Yeah, it's truly mind-blowing to think about the computing power now packed into a small device like a smartphone. Mm -hmm and how far that transformative technology has come in a very short window of time. You know, the fact that we centralize almost all of our communications, do a lot of our shopping, our banking, really manage our lives on a sheet of glass is really remarkable. And the fact that we essentially take it for granted just shows you how fast the pace of change has been. Totally. So when it comes to translating that interest to the investing world, my semi-educated guess is that innovation holds a lot of appeal for investors. And that's in part because people like to speculate what's likely going to be big next. But obviously, you are not a spectator. You are a meticulous researcher and investor. What are you out there watching for when it comes to disruption and innovation? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that Fidelity, we're in a really unique and as someone who loves this stuff, lucky position that we have access to companies across the spectrum to get a direct window in all the great ideas that are percolating. You know, and that runs from startup companies, meaning entrepreneurs that are building something new, on up to what we call incumbents. Mm -hmm. um, and you might know that term from politics, you know, the person who's already in office. But what I mean by that in this context are companies that have been around a while, that are established, where their practices and products are really tried and true and well-recognized in the marketplace. So our researchers are tracking companies all along that spectrum to see where growth is happening. And I say there's not necessarily a bias towards your lean early stage startup companies because sometimes the incumbents themselves are the ones best positioned for growth and disruption because they have long standing customer relationships that they can rely on and that they can translate into quicker adoption for their product or service and stronger revenues, which ultimately investors love. Yeah, and not just oriented around the personal technology we take for granted either, like we talked about earlier, as disruptive as those technologies are. Yeah, that's right. So take telehealth and the rise in mental wellness apps, for example. You know, we might access those through personal devices, but the industry that's ultimately experiencing disruption is healthcare. Mm. And think about the rise of automation in an industry like manufacturing. 
you know, innovations like robots have spurred efficiencies and growth for manufacturers, but also drive direct benefit for the inventors and builders of robotics technologies. So it sounds like, like you just mentioned, there are broader themes you track within innovation. But what is the bridge between those and the investor who wants to align with innovators or companies who are changing the game? Yeah, sure. So, you know, broadly speaking, one of our goals as researchers is to take a methodical approach to trying to model out which companies have the potential to be winners over time and where which great ideas can actually sustain themselves and support a great business over time. Mm -hmm. What's the next big thing? And then thematic mutual funds or ETFs that specialize in those themes and patterns and big ideas can be a great way to get exposure to companies who are at the leading edge of this. Those are relatively easy ways to, to invest in disruption. And when I say get exposure, that's really investing speak for having some of them in your mix or your portfolio and among all the investments that you own so that if they do well, you ultimately do well too as an investor. So at the start of the show, I made a reference to our cultural fascination with startup founders and these new companies. Is following the culture around entrepreneurs a good way to keep up with disruption and innovation, especially someone trying to build confidence as an investor like myself? Yeah, I, I think it's a really great idea because it's ultimately uh, related to informing yourself about the landscape of companies out there, you know, how they get valued and, and tracking the original idea that the disruptor had and asking, has it aged well? You know, if your whole brand is being an electric vehicle innovator, you're going to look pretty smart when the cost of gasoline skyrockets. So I definitely advise keeping up with the business news, keeping up with the markets. And if entrepreneurs are your point of entry to that, I think that'll really lead you to some really interesting insights. And then the resources that you're going to find at Fidelity.com lay out some interesting on-ramps to disruptive investing. And if there's a certain industry or area of innovation that really uh, captures your imagination, I think it'll allow you to dive deep into that as well. Well, great. I want to go out and disrupt some stuff right now. So thank you so much, Chris. It was great speaking with you today. Likewise, of course. Thanks, Rod. Our next guest not only wrote what is considered the top textbook on innovation strategy, she also wrote what sounds like my memoir, Quirky, which is actually a book about breakthrough innovators who have changed the world and traits they have in common with each other. Professor Melissa Schilling, welcome to Bright Ideas. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I know a big focus of your work is innovation strategy, which sounds like something that would be really useful to know about. Are innovators actually strategic or are they just persistent and lucky? I think most of the time they have to be all three. Mm. I think when we see a successful innovator, there has been luck in terms of being at the right time at the right place. Uh, they also have uh, traits probably in them that make them particularly persistent or risk tolerant. So for example, serial breakthrough innovators tend to have really high self-efficacy, which is when you have extreme faith in your ability to overcome obstacles to achieve your goals. That's gonna make you take on bigger projects and it's gonna make you really persistent and resilient so that you don't stop when you encounter failures, you just keep pushing forward. Those traits are extremely important. But there's also great strategy. So really great serial breakthrough innovators tend to have picked projects that are big idealistic goals that rally people to their cause and help create a lot of ego defense for the innovator. And also projects that have tapped a really valuable part of the technology S-curve. So if we think about technology uh, performing performance improving over time, it tends to improve in an S-shaped curve. And what that means is that at the beginning, it's hard and there's lots of problems and we don't have the right suppliers and it's, you know, we make a lot of mistakes and, and it, performance improvement is really slow. And then at some point, things start to uh, accelerate because we get more knowledge, we get a better interface, we have better suppliers, we have enabling technologies. And so performance is improving really fast at that stage. And then at some point, technology performance tends to plateau out again. You tend to reach the natural inherent limits of things or a satiation point in utility. And uh, if you keep investing at that stage, you know, you're, you're sort of wasting your effort. So is the trick catching trends before that final curve? Yeah, knowing what that curve is shaped like, knowing where you are on it, and investing in projects where there's a lot of payoff from your effort is hugely important. Yeah, especially when you can cross that with the self-efficacy. Did I say that right? Okay. Yes, it's, 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 it's a tongue twister. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Professor Schilling, for joining us today. There is a lot to understand about where game-changing ideas come from, what sets them up for success, how consumers are going to respond. It can go on and on, but this has just been really great. Thank you. This has been really fun for me too. Yeah, take care. And to all of you watching, keep innovating, keep researching innovative companies and founders, keep changing the game. Definitely check out fidelity.com disruption if you want more details on investing and innovation and 
Stay tuned for the next episode of Bright Ideas. See you soon.